So I'm very curious to hear your thoughts as to how should we look at cord injuries from a classification scale. And as you're looking for the slide, are you going to are you going to pick up on the theme of Asia A is not Asia A? Uh, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, thanks for having me out, Jens and uh, SSF. Uh, so I gave a very similar talk at this conference, uh, the seventh annual Spine Summit, three years ago. And a lot has changed from 2021 to 2024. And so when I more or less tasked myself with giving this talk again. Um, I, I really wanted to, to make some serious changes to this, and, and you'll see why here in, in a few minutes. Um, so we've talked a lot about classification systems already today. Uh, the reasons for much of them are communication. We can, like Ian's brought up <clears throat> and, and others, we can have somebody, a resident, call us on the phone at 2 in the morning and say, hey, this is a T looks level four, or this is a B3 hyperextension injury. Um, it just makes a very efficient, simple communication. Um, and the classification systems also have obviously a very clear and beneficial use in research that hopefully makes us better over time in taking care of these patients. Why do we need this, and why is it important for spinal cord injury specifically? Well, spinal cord injury is just so heterogeneous, so there has to be some type of language that we can all use together. And uh, also very important, it's a, it's a very valuable prognostic tool to examine the natural history of these, of these patients. Um, so a lot of, this, of these slides were from my talk three years ago. And um, again, we've already kind of gone over the McCormick and Gaines low chairing <laughs> classification for burst fractures. Um, and there's several multiple classification systems that, I, that I've outlined here. We've talked about uh, how many models or how many columns there are in the spine, two versus three. Um, and we've also gone over many of the AO spine classification systems that Yins has been um, so involved with over the years. Um, you know, I was put on the spot earlier in our uh, panel of do I use uh, AO personally? I, I do sometimes. Um, to me, like I said, I, I find it personally confusing, and it's definitely confusing. I don't, I don't think we'll ever be able to task our ER physicians uh, to learn AO and efficiently communicate that to us, um, mainly because it's a sum of its many parts. The neurologic status there, although there has been some new things uh, coming out, uh, it doesn't necessarily or hasn't integrated well into that system uh, since its infancy. Um, and fractures are uh, very heterogeneous. They may not always fit exactly um, um, into a particular category um, in that classification. So the classification systems that we do use currently for spinal cord injury, you've got neurologic injury classification systems, you've got fracture morphology systems, and you've also got kind of that, that um, neurologic and fracture morphology combo classification. So um, Dr. Hofstetter, went over some of the uh, basics of the, of the Asia uh, system. And it's a very, uh, pro is that it's very granular, uh, provides a lot of very useful data um, and going myotome by myotome mm -hmm. on these patients, as well as examining their um, uh, sensory uh, function as well. Um, but it is complex. And when, when you look at the all the possible comp combinations that you can achieve in the Asia score, it's something like almost 28 million different combinations that you can achieve um, uh, in, the, in the worksheet. Um, and lastly, with regard to our current systems that we have, again, I'm just kind of brushing over a lot of this because we've already discussed it um, in, in detail already today. White and Punjabi cervical stability score, we've got the T-Lex and the subaxial. Um, score that we use as well. Um, last time I gave this talk, again, uh, I was tasked with looking at future alternatives uh, going forward. Uh, Jens and I published together um, in Neurosurgery Clinics of America about a, a possible alternative looking at uh, the uh, best level of function below, or the um, best level of function below the level of injury, um, and, and kind of more or less uh, simplifying that so that we can get away from a hyper granular exam such as uh, the Asia. Um, we've also done a little bit of work as well in trying to come up with a more useful scoring system 
uh, for um, uh, teasing out the severity of central cord syndrome. Uh, but what I really was excited about and uh, to talk about today was looking at the future um, uh, beyond a lot of these things. Um, and, I, and I think in order to do so, we kind of have to step back and we have to look at milestones within our society <laughs> technologically. Um, so if you look at the rise of humans, it took about 100,000 years or so for us to go from rise of humanity to, to us discovering agriculture. After that, it took about 10,000 years for us to go from agriculture to our industrial age. It then took about another 150 years to go from the industrial age to us discovering nuclear energy and how to harness that power. Then it took about 50 years to discover the internet and 25 years from the birth of the internet to now artificial intelligence, which really blew up and came onto the scene in 2022 in a big way. So, you know, part of this is just um, uh, human milestones that we've, we've achieved, and part of this also is Moore's Law. And so what is the next big thing for us gonna be? Uh, we don't know yet. Um, it'll probably happen in the next five to 10 years, though. Is that gonna be sentience, where technology is going to be aware of itself and gonna be able to communicate with us on a human level? Um, is there gonna be a technological singularity that occurs? Um, so these are questions that we have to ask ourselves, and um, I will tie this into spinal cord injury, I promise you. We're not in a bubble either. Spinal, or, uh, uh, artificial intelligence is here to stay, and if, if you look at the advent of ChatGPT in November of 2022, and then you look at the, some of the leaders in the, in the public space regarding this, their stock prices in Wall Street uh, have, have done nothing but go up since then. Um, if it was a bubble, it, was, it would have already popped. The future really is now, and a lot of surgeons in the past, including myself, have fought with technology a little bit, as evidenced by this picture of Yin's about to go to battle with the Globot. But really, we have got to embrace this, and we've got to learn how to harness the technology of AI, because it's only going to get bigger, better, and faster um, in the years going, uh, going forward. So I wanted to kind of rethink um, uh, how spinal cord injury classifications should look going forward. And I think you're gonna have AI-based systems that are gonna be big, heavy data sets primarily used in the research world. And you're gonna have clinician-oriented classification systems that I've already mentioned and that we've talked about many times already today. And, and there's gotta be a way that we combine those two things together. So AI-based classification systems, um, if we look at, at, at the value of that and, and why it's so powerful, well, these are gonna use exascale computing abilities. And so one of the most powerful AI computers right now in the world does one quintillion calculations per second. That's one with 18 zeros behind it. That's one million trillions, okay? So these are very powerful, very capable computer systems that are gonna be able to analyze a sheer volume and parameter of data that we just physically aren't gonna be able to do ourselves with our current level of technology. And what these systems are gonna be able to do is provide quantitative uh, analytical, analytical tools that are used for the purposes of machi machine learning that's gonna enhance our uh, research primarily in the laboratory um, and clinical research setting. So as I said, these are gonna be very large, extremely uh, granular data sets, hundreds if not thousands of parameters that we can apply toward our spinal cord injury patients. So things that we are already looking at, the level of injury, the degree of stenosis, uh, we could probably incorporate the amount of spinal cord edema that we're seeing on imaging. Um, and I think we're eventually gonna be able to highlight or discount parameters that we previously weren't aware of. Dr. Hofstetter mentioned um, a lot of um, primary and secondary injury biomarkers that we're looking at, factors that affect axonal healing, et cetera. So I think a lot of these things are gonna hopefully come to mind and come to light uh, with some of the supercomputers uh, that are, are coming our way. And it's gonna have, these, these data sets, once the, once the machine literally learns from um, uh, the data that it's pumping out, it's gonna be an, an incredible prognostic tool that we've never uh, had at our disposal before. With the ultimate goal, of course, being able to completely alter and improve our treatment of spinal cord injury in the future. And that's from a surgical perspective, a pharmaceutical perspective, critical care and rehabilitation as well. So how do we, how do we harness that power and get it out of a data set 
or a massive registry and use it uh, in our hands. Well, if we have a patient that comes to our ER, the patient's gonna present to us with spinal cord injury, and we're gonna be the ones evaluating those patients. The machine is not capable of doing that, um, at least not now. So we're gonna be the ones to triage and clinically make those decisions. And we have to be the ones that are going to use our own ASIA scores, our TLIC scores, our um, uh, motor impairment scores, et cetera. Um, and once we do that, then we will be able to supply the algorithms with some of that data and create a real-time classification result using some AI software uh, that can then produce a clinically uh, meaning, meaningful classification and help guide our treatment. Um, and that's a, that's a key term that I'll discuss here. So as the surgeon or as the clinician, we have to be able to, to diagnose these patients properly, and we have to be able to feed the, some of these data uh, to these algorithms. And only us as clinicians are gonna be able to mobilize people, mobilize resources, order labs, resuscitate these patients, um, take care of them from a critical care perspective. That's not gonna go away. Um, we're still gonna be the ones responsible for doing that. And we have to be the ones to actually administer um, these treatments. Uh, we, we talked a little bit earlier about um, particularly uh, Dr. McGuire, how one of uh, the, the, the next, in the next wave of AI for the future, how we could look at a fracture, you know, a, a A4 fracture or a B2 fracture, and that could, uh, we could unify treatment for that across the world. And that could, you know, that's true. We could have some um, ability to um, increase our efficiencies from that standpoint. Um, but at the end of the day, only us, we are gonna be able to once to have that, that goal of care discussion uh, with patients' family, patients' friends, that again, a, a machine or AI cannot do. What will artificial intelligence be able to do alongside us? Well, it's gonna be able to multitask you know, with the vast amount of calculations um, uh, these machines can do uh, per second. Um, we need to use that, we need to take advantage of that. Um, and it can quantitatively analyze radiology, laboratory studies, uh, the neurologic status of patients, et cetera, at a very fast pace and produce a clinically meaningful result to that, or to us. Um, and ultimately provide a recommendation uh, regarding surgical, including, or regarding surgery, uh, including the timing of surgery, what kind of medications do we give these patients, pharmaceutical interventions, such as uh, increasing patients' MAP goals. So, you know, visually, this is what that would look like. Us as clinicians, we compile that first um, set of data, or first set of, um, of data points as these patients uh, present to us. Uh, we obtain and order the objective data, such as labs, imaging, uh, MRI studies, et cetera, and then AI is going to uh, generate data based on those pr parameters and produce a classification result for us. Then it's our responsibility as the surgeon to kind of take a step back um, with that humanistic global big picture view and ultimately decide on what the, the best treatment plan is going forward um, and, pr and ultimately provide a surgeon derived treatment plan with the help of a, a classification such as this. So what that's gonna be able to do is provide real-time data in the clinical setting using computation, computational power of AI. And as I said, the next big wave, the next big technological advance, if you look at the, the recent past, is probably coming in the next five to 10 years. And I bet it's probably gonna have something to do uh, with sentience and how are we gonna use that? How are we gonna harness that in the clinical setting? Um, and the classification systems going forward, they're gonna be extremely comprehensive. They're gonna be very robust. They're gonna have a very powerful data behind them, providing new insights that we have not seen yet before. And that's gonna to lead to faster treatment decisions, better treatment decisions, and ultimately improve our treatment of spinal cord injury as a whole. Um, so, you know, we've never lived in a time quite like this before. So it's exciting to see what's gonna come next. Um, I know this wasn't a, a very heavy scientific lecture, but more so, or what I find important for a lecture like this is to really um, inspire the next generation of surgeons uh, in using this technology that's so new to us. So, thank you. 
So at uh, Herman Memorial, you, you're one of the leading trauma centers in our country, and certainly in South Texas. Uh, is there a consistent messaging system? Is there a consistent uh, documentation system of cord injuries at this point in time? Is there one algorithmic um, kind of a data entry, I don't know what you all use for this epic or so, where you have your templates that basically force you to fill out the various fields? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Um, a lot of that has to deal with the fact that us as a system recently had a billion dollar overhaul of our electronic healthcare record system. Um, but that will come uh, once we get through this initial phase and we're, we're gonna have to. I mean, this is the only way that we're gonna make ourselves better. This is uh, so spoken from my heart. And again, this drives me nuts. I mean, we, we have, thanks to our fellows also, we have a very nice library of smart phrases. You started one of those also. It's been refined over the years, but we try to have every patient have, and you see it in our case descriptions, mm -hmm. a basic core data set, uh, as simplistic as it is. Um, but uh, this is something we all can aspire to, I think, just having a minimum currency of essential data points. Um, yeah. And that we don't do that uh, still drives me nuts. So we'll, we'll rehash that later uh, in the rapid fires. But thank you, Wyatt. Sure. And for a return.